The abomination of desolation. Everybody's heard of this phrase, right? Even if you don't know much about Rome Lace, and everybody's heard of the abomination of desolation. Right? I've actually never heard the phrase. Never heard mm -hmm. it? It's probably all the better. You've heard it, right, Kurt? Yes. Yes, sir. Yep, so. many movies that uh, sit there and take that uh, phrase. Movies we probably shouldn't watch. But, yeah. <laughs> so, here's our little, and th this is John MacArthur, a guy that is probably one of our top ministers of the day uh, he is his dad was a preacher before him I'm not sure if his dad or him wrote it but they have their own commentary that they wrote for the New Testament if you're a living pastor and you've written a comment or not a comment yeah commentary you've written a commentary you're pretty much you're pretty high up in their knowledge world that's like theological kind of stuff so he is one of those smart guy preacher guys Although, I think on the faith side, he's a little weak. Not dispensationalist too, right? Of course. So anyways, this is uh, I, I, this was the clip I found this week for Bob Mason. This lace was from him, surprisingly. Okay. Kurt can't see. Kurt, you need to turn around so you can see the TV. That means the guided one. Now I gotta tell you this. And Kurt, you can you can uh, chime in on this. He's talking about the twelfth Imam. He's talking about the Muslim world. Yeah. I think I've seen this one. In the nineties and earlier, nobody ever talked about the Muslims in end day no. prophecies. Nowadays they are the center of it. Go figure. Yeah, there you go. He is the establisher of the final caliphate. The world must follow him as he takes over or he will destroy all enemies of Islam. He will come and he will carry on holy war and either you convert or you're killed. He will have an army. His army will be a massive army and his army will go from nation to nation to punish the unbelievers. This army will carry black flags and on those black flags there will be one word and that one word will be the word punishment. By the way, the Iranian army today carries black flags. He will lead the army of black flags first to Israel, slaughter all the Jews, and then he will establish his rule in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. That's what their literature said. The Mahdi or the Tepfelth Imam it's interesting because in his book he actually talks about how Carmen. Red Mark, that's me. How that the uh, the futurists go on about how the Israelite the, the Jewish people need to all go back to Israel. They need to come together as a nation so that they can get reconnected with God and start doing their sacrifices so that they can be slaughtered. This is what they teach. Boy, you put it all together and you're kind of like, wow, what? Really? Yeah, it is what it is. But, uh, <laughs> anyways, so we will dive in to chapter 11. So, chapter 11. Like I said, when you talk to futurists, once you get past the first level of what are you even talking about, and you start responding to them, and especially if any kind of, well, are you sure? They're going to quickly get into the abomination of desolation. This is a very, very big part of the whole thing. So he starts up the chapter talking about uh, that a little bit in Matthew 24, kind of the last half of the chapter. Remember, they read it. They really go to math through chapter 24 pretty heavily. Um, so I'm just going to the second page here. So to wrench the abomination of desolation 
out of that context and suggest that it will occur thousands of years later is to do violence to the text and context of the prophecy. But if the abomination or desolation took place in that time period and not in our future, then who or what is it? Jesus gave us a clue when he said that it was spoken of by the prophet Daniel in Matthew 24, 15. So let's go back to see if Daniel gave us any answers. Daniel wrote about the abomination and desolation in three places. Daniel 9, 26, 27, 11, 31, and 12, 11. He says, I do not have the space to explore this topic fully because it is quite complex. It is one of those prophecies that has a hundred different interpretations. I recommend the 70 Weeks in the Great Tribulation by Philip Morrow online. So that is a book that he recommends to kind of wrap your head around that because just that whole thing gets pretty involved. And the problem is there's just, like you said, everybody and their brother has their own interpretation of what that's saying. And so in order to look at all that, it takes a lot. You know, and that's why he doesn't delve into it real hard. <clears throat> so he focuses on just one aspect. I want to focus in on one passage in this discourse that almost everybody agrees on. It is the passage in Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. Probably the most famous messianic prophecy in the Old Testament is Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. This is because it predicts the coming Messiah within a specific number of years from a specific historical event, the decree to restore or rebuild Jerusalem, most likely fulfilled in the decree of Antraxis <clears throat> first, around 458 B.C. in Nehemiah 2.1. The 70 weeks is actually 77s, or years of or 490 years and that everyone agrees on it's, it's actually talking about 490 years it's just a matter of interpretation it would place messiah approximately in the very lifetime of jesus isn't that interesting so you always hear whenever anyone starts talking about these 70 weeks of sevens and all this stuff they start doing all these calculations and all this and that and it's like you gotta pull out an Akbus and 20 history books to figure out how, how they get from Daniel or whatever all the way up to today and the problem is when you look at his prophecy up to Jesus day it's pretty simple it's the 77 you know 70 weeks of 70 or 7 or whatever so it, it is the 490 years and as you get into the minor prophets of the Old Testament, God starts speaking to the people less and less. And as you read through those old prophets, you see he's pulling back. He's not talking to people. And they, they uh, one of the last things you hear about worship of God from the people is one of the guys is uh, some Israelite. He was a priest for somebody. Or some false god, some rich guy, and he left there right away or something, and he took one of the idols and he brought that idol and set up in his house or something, and and people are like, oh, you got you got an idol, you got contact with God, we're 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 we'll be our priest, and, and see it's and and it talks about a few of those last books talks about everyone did what was right in their own eyes, they lost they completely lost track of what following God was was about what it meant their their country was you know their people were scattered it was it's like the day they were left alone worse it was they were like a people without a god and without a country and without they were just left they were just abandoned to a real degree and so you read that in the old some of the last books of the old uh of the minor prophets it, it's kind of a bleak story a bleak part of Jewish history it's it's kind of sad and, um, and that's where God left them but <clears throat> from Daniel's testimony to, uh, prophecy up to where Jesus came you get that 490 years and so it's really weird when you see that that they do this whole thing of that's coming up in our day and age it's like why do you make something so simple all of a sudden so complicated it doesn't even make sense because they're trying to find a way to prove 
what their story is uh, rather than take the Bible for what it says. So it gets kind of weird. But so he gives you the references in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel's prophecy was given to Israel because Israel had been unfaithful. Yeah, scoot over a little bit, Caleb. They're looking at the back of your head. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Daniel's prophecy was given to Israel because Israel had been unfaithful to Yahweh. He had punished his people with exile in Babylon where Daniel was writing from. When Jesus cried out, Matthew one twenty one. Well, before that he says, uh, yeah, so that, that's a different verse he's quoting. When Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross. He was putting an end to sin with his once for all sacrifices that atoned for iniquity and brought in everlasting righteousness. Just as Daniel prophesied in Hebrews 6, 9, 12 through 14. Sorry, Kurt. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, say something. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Careful, Jesus, don't, don't trust me too hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jesus confirmed the promise or seal both vision and prophet in Daniel 9 24, in fulfilling the messianic promise that all the prophets had looked forward to. According to 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. And so again, this is to get you looking into this stuff. And um, it is quite interesting just to read what he has and then to go and dig into scripture a little more and just verify things. Like say you want to go a little farther on the, on the 70 weeks and the Great Tribulation thing and read up on Philip Morrow. It actually isn't as complicated as they make it sound. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot to wrap your head around because it is a poetic thing. And poetry is always, you know, you got to understand what's what's being meant. Um, so there is some of that. But it's, it's not as complicated as they make it out to be. The reason it's that complicated is because they're trying to twist it to fit their narrative rather than just take it for what it is. When you do that, yeah, it gets very, very easy. So, I guess I'm a little understandably confused. The, why are people putting the 70 years, 70 weeks thing in the future? Is that like... That's part of the futuristic view. Okay. And that's what most of America believes in, most of what the Western Christian world believes in. And what was the 70 weeks supposed to signify? Daniel gives a prophecy, and that's where, you, where he writes about the 70 weeks of sevens. And <clears throat> so that's... It comes out to be 490 years. But Daniel's one that wrote that, and it was part of the prophecy they had. Uh, chapter, chapter 9, I believe, talks about that. So that is a very key section of Scripture when you're talking about Revelation, okay. because it does refer to that, um, <clears throat> at least in, Revelation, in the futurist view. So then... <clears throat> um, Titi, can you grab a Bible or two real quick? Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you want to just pull out a Bible, I want to have you guys read uh, Daniel 9, 26. I need someone to read that out loud. Towards the end of the Old Testament, so past the middle of the Bible. So Daniel nine. Daniel nine twenty six. Go ahead, Kurt. And after the sixty two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, vessel, and present. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, which that's already happened. 
and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is torment is poured out on the desolate that's good so <clears throat> he's he's talking about that in this next part here so just in the first part of that verse the messiah is the leading figure in the whole prophecy so that even the destruction of the temple is related to his death in fact the people who destroy the temple are providentially his armies in Matthew 22 2 7 so he spends he goes back into 927 uh, which I believe you read 27 as well correct Kurt yeah, yeah. so the three and a half years or half of the week is not in the middle of the future of uh, in the middle of a future tribu tribulation it represents the approximately three and a half years of Christ's ministry there are very distinctly different take on that verse or so of what's the future the three and a half weeks the future they, they talk that's the three and a half years of tribulation and mm. all the people are gonna be dying we got all these crazy bug like creatures and all this stuff going on <laughs> Yeah. And That's what I keep hearing. but when you read the context, it's not. It's talking about Jesus, and his ministry was three and a half years. That's all the ministry he did was three and a half years. Can't say that. And so it's kind of crazy to see how they're going to do that, you know. But <clears throat> so he's pointing that out and helping you see that. <laughs> it happened again. Um, it was Jesus or let's see in the Bible Satan does not make covenants and that's important because if you understand the future is view it talks that they, they talk about uh, the Antichrist the great Antichrist uh, making this covenant so who would have been the Antichrist then if it wasn't now he does get into that but it's it's not that complicated because even those who don't know the preterist view if they're well studied, they know who the Antichrist was supposed to be. It was the emperors. The Roman Jay emperors. comes out and just says it. Yeah. Um, By the way, it's, it's this guy. And so they talk about Satan or the Antichrist making this covenant, but you think about it, you know, common sense has a lot of value. Wait, the Antichrist is not Satan, right? <laughs> Antichrist no. is someone who's against Christ. So arguably, I mean, Satan definitely would be at least an antichrist. And um, is someone that is completely against Christ. So, and Satan, truthfully, is just the title. It, it's accuser. Um, but matter of fact, you could you could you could say that he pretends to be like a friend. Or he yeah. The Bible speaks about how uh, the devil appears as an angel of light. Yeah. So. He would do to, to get to him. He would do. He would pretend to be a Christian for a means to an end to their destruction. Well, the problem is, you know, even like Hitler. I mean, Hitler was a pretty evil human, and you know, can you make covenants with evil? You can't. Uh, even you know, with Hitler. He didn't want to take on Poland yet. Um, he wasn't ready for it. They, they didn't have the troops ready to put in there. They didn't have the transportation wasn't quite in place. The food, the ammo wasn't there. So he was willing to make a truce with, with Poland. Um, and uh, he also did the same thing with Russia. He made a truce with Russia early in the war. He said, I don't want to fight you guys. I don't want to fight you. And he made a truce with them. And then later on in the war, he attacked them because evil people have no values they, there's no covenant making with these kind of people definitely not with Satan and the problem is that they talk about how the Antichrist makes this covenant but there's nowhere in the Bible where Satan makes a covenant ever it, it, it doesn't make sense scripturally speaking so what uh, covenant the Antichrist make? Um, I'd have to look and see I don't know if he pulls that out or not but but he says the Bible in the Bible Satan does not make covenants. God does. God is always the one that's made the covenants. 
the strong covenant is not of the Antichrist. It is the new covenant of the Christ. It is not the Antichrist who puts an end to sacrifice. Now, technically, he can make covenants. It's just not going to be kept. <clears throat> right. But it's... So, I mean, I'm sure he has it in uh, one of your verses here. So, Daniel 9, 27. And he, and he puts in parentheses Messiah, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall one come who makes desolate until the decree end is poured out on the desolator. <clears throat> and part of that is you get a lot of big words, a lot of big words that we don't really use much. And remember, when you're warm, turn that off, because everyone else is warmer than you. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah, you're feeling pretty um, hot right now. <laughs> <clears throat> the, uh, so that's why he's talking about this, this covenant thing, because... 927 talks about the strong covenant be made and that bringing an end to the sacrifice and uh, sacrifices have been there ever since Abraham they were part of your faith part of showing that you trusted in God and, and believed God in, in what he was saying and so you were sacrificing you know shedding the blood of your best animal your best income your best livelihood you were you were giving that up and there was blood shed. and even in the garden of eden you know adam and eve they sinned they got put out of the garden there was blood shed. it wasn't theirs but they were naked they got out of the garden and god gave them animal skins they covered himself with leaves and so once he got out of the garden he covered him with animal skins sheep skins because those sheep their blood was sacrificed in order to cover their sins and it's like a payment somebody goes to jail <clears throat> you can go pay a bond for them and get them out and they're out they're free as long as they don't leave the state because the time is coming they're going to have to go to court and pay for answer for what they did or prove that they didn't do it and in the same way you know, our system is largely based on the scriptures so in the same way that blood atonement that blood sacrifice that was your payment so you can still leave and breathe and go visit people and do your thing and work and pay your bills and everything else. But the time of reckoning is coming where you must answer for all this stuff. And because all that sacrificing was just an atonement. It was just a down payment. But when Jesus was sacrificed, then the full payment was paid. He literally paid the full payment. So now you don't even go to the court date. It's done. It's paid. Nobody can have any charge against you. Which, you know, going all the way back around to that book on healing and stuff, I mean, and why, why are we suffering like the rest of the world? Why do we have about as much divorce and all the other junk in the church as we do outside the church? Because we're not living in that atonement. We're missing it. And so, in a real way, um, Jesus paid all that price and we're kind of spitting on it we're kind of like whatever you know we're, we're not availing that payment that was paid for us and so really he's talking about the same thing here that <clears throat> that uh, three and a half weeks that the, the covenant um the strong covenant Excuse is not me. an antichrist. It's a new covenant of Christ. It's a new covenant because the old covenant ended. Because they couldn't keep the old covenant. <coughs> Paul wrote about that. He said, you, we can't even do this stuff. And you're trying to put this on the new believers that aren't Jewish. What are you doing? This is not what it's about. It's not, it's not, yeah, yeah, we need to live right. We need to live, you know, follow the rules of the law. But that's not what it's about. It's, it's about being freed and there's still sacrifice to be made just not with animals or blood or any of that it's um, it's like a sacrifice you make yourself well the sacrifice is you know some say well you know salvation isn't free you don't just say a prayer and sign your name you you're you're giving your life I and mean, grizzly adams i don't know if any of you guys ever remember or ever seen grizzly adams I love grizzly adams <clears throat> yeah well you're old these guys aren't old <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Grizzly Adams was kind of a cool soul. As a guy that Deep inside ended up being uh, tried, right? he, he was gonna be he was gonna be hung because he he killed a guy in an accident, right, or something, or self defense or something. Yeah. And so he took off to the Great White North, and I don't know where it was if it was Canada or America. I'm assuming America, but wherever he was in the Great White North, away from civilization, uh, living out in the woods on his own, and. Um, <clears throat> the deal was he if he went to civilization they would have, they would have tried him and killed him and but he he was just defending or whatever and so it, you know, it, it was kind of happenstance or whatever so he stayed out of civilization um the uh, there weren't cameras to vindicate him <laughs> yeah so um, he he ends up making a, a tree. A, 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 what do you, he he saves an Indian's life. So back then, Indians and, and whites were you know kind of at odds with each other because the Indians were like, "You're taking our land." So it's not a good the time. Roma. The Roma was invaded. So that Indian he saved the guy's life. I don't remember how, but he saved his life. And and throughout history, there's this, been this thing of you know throughout cultures throughout the world, you saved my life. My life is not yours. You know, I, I am a dead man. I would be dead except for you. Therefore, my life is yours. So that Indian always kept an eye on him and helped him throughout the series. You know, somebody gets in a bad situation, all of a sudden that Indian shows up again. You know, and and they're they're blood brothers. They made a covenant. They sliced their hands, put their hands together, and they mingled their blood. And mm, that blood covenant is what humans have done forever if they were going to completely make a serious commitment to commit to each other. And that's what God did. That comes from God. That thing of setting blood in order to bind ourselves to a covenant, to an agreement. That's a God-ordained thing from the beginning. And, and nowadays we do a lot to make all that go away. Because we're we're a society that doesn't appreciate God, that wants to ignore God, wants to deny God, but reality is blood covenants are real, and God made that blood covenant. He made it with Abraham. The Israelites could not honor that contract. That they failed for hundreds of years, over and over and over. There was like three or four righteous kings, and some of them not that righteous. All the rest were terrible. They were just terrible. They would, as soon as they became king, they'd build all the altars on the high hills for the bad false gods. I mean, they just went right after false gods, 100%. And, uh, and the people did too. And, and it was, they were not following God. And um, so eventually God let them go. And when he did, <clears throat> after two, 300 years, then Jesus came to constitute a new covenant because the old covenant had been destroyed had been done away with they kept it along the, the Pharisees and, and Sadducees kept it going as a purpose of religion and trying to do what they could but they totally were missing it and and you see that as he's talking about them in the New Testament and so then he initiated a new covenant and that's why he came was to initiate the new covenant because there was no way for man to be reunited with with God and man lost what it meant to be to be united with God and to, and to be following him so Jesus came just like the parable and I'll say this if any of this stuff is making sense you must go and start reading the Bible with this in mind because it will change like I said in the beginning about dispensationalism changes how you read the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It changes everything. And the majority of what you've been taught is from that perspective of dispensationalism. And if what you're seeing makes sense, then dispensationalism is wrong. And if that's the case, so much of the scriptures change. It's worth rereading them and seeing wow, is it really that? Whoa. You know, it'll open, it, 
the Holy Spirit is able to start speaking more because you've pulled down some blinders that were falsely put there. So go back and read your Bible again and look for what God's really teaching there. It, it'll, it, it should blow your mind. You're like, wow, I've never quite got that. It changes a lot. Um, the context consistently fits the first century where all those things occurred. The book of Matthew was written to Jews. Because of this, it has many Hebraisms and Old Testament references and concepts that most Jews would know when reading them. Top of page 101. And I'll go to the bottom of 101. In fact, at another time, Jesus referred to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem as punishment for the Jews not recognizing the time of the visitation of God in the Messiah. Revelation. Okay, so that's in Luke. We're going to be like, okay, the world's still going to end eventually, right? Jesus is going to come back. I, I, I think what it is is we've been under the idea that there's all this stuff written about the end times. And I think in reality, without having my head wrapped all around it, we, we have very little time about how things are going to happen. Well, we, just, we do know that Jesus is returning. Isn't it mentioned somewhere that, like, <clears throat> Earth is going to turn to hell? A lot of that stuff he's saying is really just Hebraisms. Yeah. And, um, and so in reality, I think that the deal is it just, you say, hey, I'm going to come back. So the new, the new Earth that... I hear about is he's saying that it's not like this yeah. is going to become he hasn't gotten into those okay. verses so I don't know where I'm not sure he has his head wrapped around all that stuff but it's definitely not in this book um, and so I don't know I mean for how perfect that new earth seems I don't think it's happened yet it's well similar. the idea is a lot of that stuff or it might be symbolism it's, it's symbolism um, you know one of the things people always will say well the blood isn't it? The, run, the, the, the moon has never turned red, and and, and uh, the rivers have never turned blood, and therefore this stuff didn't happen. <laughs> well, it was, you know, words that they used to describe things, but it wasn't that it actually happened. Just like other places in the Old Testament, they had the same phrases, and stuff didn't really happen like that. They were exaggerating, like we say, oh, man, I'm going to kill you. No, you're not. You're just saying it. Or, oh man, if I can slaughter them guys. Well, you take that out of context to mean what we're really saying. And so, what was this like? Swords and axes? Or what, what happened here? No, it just means they beat them bad in football. So, we have the same thing. Every culture does. And a lot of what you see in Revelation is that. And so, he gives proofs and, and helps you explain and understand and to see which, how that works out exactly. Um, what time are we looking at? Two twenty. Two twenty. Twelve. I got okay. Okay. So, okay. so that thing where we're talking about uh, talking about punishment for the Jews for not recognizing the time of visitation, he gets that out of Luke nineteen forty four through forty four. He has some other lines. Says, "For the days will come upon you when your enemies <coughs> will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you." in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children with you and you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation hmm. kind of makes sense but i'll tell you i i don't think i've ever heard a sermon along those lines because it doesn't fit with the narrative um <clears throat> Sorry, I, I got lost there. Can you, can you say it again? For the days will come upon you. This is Luke. Chapter at towards the end of 19. It says, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground. And they will not leave one stone upon you because you do not know the time of your visitation. What does it mean by the time of your visitation? He's saying that's talking about the visitation of the Messiah. 
Jesus. When God of the universe visited the earth, they didn't recognize it. So they died because of that. Right. Mm. Yeah. They were, they literally, as a people, killed the Son of God. There's a, he gave a parable. I can't remember which book it's in. He might even talk about it in here, but I know he talked about it somewhere in his book. A parable of uh, a people that are tending a vineyard and they wouldn't pay like they're supposed to for multiple times. Multiple years, so the the king sent a messenger and said, "Hey, what are you doing?" They're like, "We have to pay you," and so they they beat up the messenger and sent him back. He's like, "That ain't cool." So he sent another messenger. He said, "You need to understand. You're messing with the king here. You can't do this. You just send him in your vineyard." They're like, "We're gonna beat him really good." They sent him back. He's like. The king's like, man, I don't get this. Trying to, trying to be nice here. So he sends his son, his own son, to this people over here. Say, hey, you need to be paying for this vineyard. And those people killed his son, the king's son. Oh, this is, okay, this is symbolism for... This is a son. parable that Jesus told. And they teach this parable differently than, than this guy would teach it. Differently than I would teach it. Because so then... The king finds out his son has been killed by his people. So what's he do? And he asks the people. He says, so what should this king do to these people over this vineyard? What should he do? Oh, they, and, the, and the people answered him. The Israelites that killed Jesus, that same people, they answered him and said, oh, that king needs to just go kill them guys. Just wipe them out. In the day, that was not a question. That was a dumb deal. Nowadays, we're like, can't do that. Back then, it was a different kind of world. No, no question. You need, that king needs to go wipe those guys out. 100%. Just obliterate them and start over and get some new people. That's what happened. He ended the covenant. And he sent punishment to the people that he had been sending his prophets to. And he eventually sent his son to. And they killed his son. And so... He said, fine, we get new people in here. And there's plenty of places in the New Testament where it says, you know, when we're looking for the, the Israelites to do their stuff, they didn't, so I brought in new people. The, the, the parable of the wedding feast. Had a wedding feast plan, and yeah, we not a lot of people coming. Well, find more. You can't find any more. Everyone's saying they don't want to come. Well, go to the highways and byways. Find people. Find anybody. Get them in here. Fill the seats. He said, we still don't have filled. He said, find whoever you pay people. Get them in here. Fill these seats. And, and the phraseology that comes out in that parable, God saying, okay, we're now going to Gentiles. We're going beyond the Jewish people. We're going to the Gentiles. We're going to the whole world. Because this wedding feast is going to be filled. And that's what happened. The problem is the future is view. Kind of skims over all of that, glosses over a lot of it. <clears throat> so it talks about in AD 70, at that time the Romans set up a barricade all around Jerusalem, just like Jesus said they would. They surrounded the city on every side, just like Jesus predicted. And they tore down both city and temple to the ground, not leaving one stone of that temple upon another, just like Jesus prophesied. In AD 70, Jerusalem was trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, just as Jesus said it would be. The Jews experienced great wrath, fell by the edge of the sword, and were led captive among the nations, just as Jesus said. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, who was not a Christian, he was a Jewish historian working for the Roman government, so he was getting paid by them to write the history as it was happening. And there was a handful of historians around at that time. He has a book called The War of the Jews. I've read, never read it, but it is referred to a good bit. Recorded in that book, he recorded the miseries and sufferings in stark fulfillment of these prophecies. So he gives an, uh, a few quotes out of Wars of the Jews. So I'm not going to read them for you, but you read them. I mean, 
That, that's a pretty nasty time. And the pr thing is, when you talk to futurist people, they oh, yeah, you talk about that war from AD 70. But that war really wasn't that big a deal. It wasn't that many people. It wasn't as climatic as they say. It really wasn't a big deal. They're saying that because this is what pastors are telling them, not because they went and read the accounts themselves. That's the problem. People don't look and study up themselves. They take what's being said. And they're saying that because they've already bought into a view. And they have to back up that view. Anytime you do that, Christian or not, you're being a fool. You cannot. And in, in the world of literature and studies, it is a cardinal rule. You cannot just take someone's word take all the time. your predetermined view and make everything fit it. If you do that, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. In court of law, you can get caught doing that, and that is all dismissed. And that person, whoever you're for, is they're not winning. It's like the other the principles are going with gender stuff. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. All this stuff. Um, there's one quote here that I got highlighted. It's on page 104. And again, it's from Josephus War. Uh, and he tells you what. I say I've never read it, but he tells he gives a reference for where it is, so you can look it up. Accordingly, the multitude of those that therein perished exceeded all the destructions that either men or God ever brought upon the world. That's what the historian wrote about that war in AD 70. Sounds like it wasn't just a small little thing. Sounds like it was pretty nasty for the people involved. Uh, and he's got a lot better description. I mean, you read those few, couple pages there, it'll be like, wow, man, paint that picture in your mind and it'll match any movie you've ever seen. I know this besides the fact that was Daniel around during 300 Spartans? <clears throat> um, my guess would be no, but I'm not sure. Well, he was the son, he was mentioning the son of Xerxes, which was the one who fought. Yeah. Um,. I, I don't know for sure. I mean, he was there for several kings of Babylon. One was Belshazzar. And so part of the deal is there's different names. You know, they really liked suits of names up back then. All over the place. So Belshazzar, he probably had another name by other histories or whatever. But uh, but it's definitely not going to be that hard to look up and Google it and see. Um, now the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be 97,000. And so anyways, it is interesting that Josephus, a Jew, though not a Christian, used the same hyperbolic terminology of the siege of Jerusalem that Jesus used of the great tribulation and siege of Jerusalem. He used the same terminology. Wasn't Josephus like the king, like puppy king kind of, right? No, he's or... just a historian. Oh. That's all he did was write history. He's the one that wrote all the stuff before it. Um, he quotes another historian over here. Because the destruction of Jerusalem was coming, it was God's judgment on the Jews of rejecting Jesus. But the Christians did not reject him, so Jesus wanted his chosen people to escape before that judgment fell. Early church historian Eusebius recorded how the Christians followed Jesus' warnings. So Eusebius, I, I don't know, this early church historian, I wouldn't be surprised if he's more like two or three hundred, so this is probably after it happened, but a very recent thing compared to us, uh, historian. But the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by a revelation uh, about just about safe to approve men. Well, anyway, I'm not going to read all that, but he talks about how, and and he's, there, there are quotes in the Bible, a place in the Bible where he talks about, you know, when, when this stuff happens, flee to the hills. And it's a bad day and people are pregnant. That's what Matthew, and I think that's in Matthew. That's what Eusebius is talking about. He's talking in reference, reference to that war in AD 70. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Since the Jews did not embrace the new covenant, they were in a dead religion. The Roman army was like vultures gathering around the carcass of that dead religion to finish it off, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24, 28. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. 
So again, I mean a lot of symbolism, but when you get it taught correctly based on solid interpretation rules, you know, it starts making a lot more sense. And all of a sudden you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be able to figure out all this Kabbalah system. It's really just taking the context of what's been said in the past. <laughs> well, don't say that to someone that's a futurist. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> They will give you an earful. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but again, my, my hope is that you will read this stuff and be inspired to say, you know, let me, let me, let me see. Let me see what it's really saying for myself. Because if we don't study it for ourselves, I don't care what you believe, you're, you're, very, you're living a very weak Christian life. We are told to study the scriptures. We're told to show ourselves a good student, a good workman, someone that basically knows their stuff. And, you know, I mean, you think about it. I'm a carpenter. I got, we got a guy that just started with us about a month ago. He's about my age. He's a lot weaker than me. He's a lot slower than me. And... His skill level is like a young uh, carpenter. He, he doesn't, he's not even as skilled as most of our younger guys, which is kind of scary. The problem is we, we got a lot of people like that in the Christian world. I've been in the Christian for 30 years, but their maturity level is more like a year old no more. Uh, in, in my sermon that I spoke on my, ordination day <clears throat> I listed off a handful of authors which is by far not exhaustive where we have their testimonies and they're from all different walks of the Christian spectrum and uh, and I flat out says if you don't know these names and you're over a year old in the Lord then what in the world are you doing how can you call yourself a Christian in five years or something and not know who these people are that shaped our world that we live in today? You're not a serious student of the word. You should be knowing these people. These are people that God used, that God called, that God did stuff with. I mean, George Mueller, he was, he was way away from the spectrum of faith healing and stuff. But... He believed in God for all that he knew and all that he could. He started orphanages in a day where there really weren't orphanages. He was kind of the beginning of that world of, of big orphanages taking care of lots and lots of children. And he did it without ever asking for money. Now granted, he was in some big money circles. And granted, he probably had some money in the beginning, inherited or something, but he made it a point to not ask for money. He didn't even let his friends know a lot of times that he was going to start a new build, build a new building. He wouldn't even tell his friends. And, he, and his prayer was, God, if this is of you, then I know you bring the money in. So I'm not going to tell anybody because I want to know that it's you. And the money would come in. He'd be like, buy the land. Buy that building. Let's build it. Let's do it. And they, he did some phenomenal stuff. And it was, it was the first orphanages that were really built to take care of the kids, not just house them and get them out of people's way. And, um, you know, he wasn't a faith healer, but it doesn't matter. God used him pretty mightily in the way that he was able to be used. It, incredible stuff, incredible testimony, um, and a whole life of that. And and it was a great costume, but it was, it was an awesome thing that God did. And... What he struggled through and suffered through and, and sweat and blood and tears to get through to make happen what God was doing in him, we get to learn from that. Caleb, getting all his workout stuff going and all this stuff, he hired a coach. Because the coach not only learned a lot of stuff in the books and learned from other people, but he also learned from himself, so he has a ton of knowledge and it's not just book knowledge, it's real life knowledge. So you can work with people like Caleb and say, 
This is what you do. No, just like that. Just look at this. Do like this. No, nope, don't do that. Do like this. Okay. And uh, you can't get good without learning from the people before you. You can't. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time just relearning what they already learned. And so if we don't learn from the other people that God has risen up and used, we're not going to accomplish much for them. Those testimonies were written at a cost. It costs them to publish the books. It costs them to sit down and write all that stuff out, to have somebody proofread it, to have somebody get it all typeset and typed up or whatever they had to do to make it happen, and, and to get it marketed and to get it sold and to, you know, to actually have it out there and survive through time. It costs. And if we don't make use of that and learn from what has already been invested into for our sake, then what kind of fools are we, right? I was talking to someone, I think a pastor the other day, I didn't see any pictures up there on the screen, and you know, he always liked, our pastor always liked Schwarzenegger when he was young, boy, Schwarzenegger, he was young when Schwarzenegger was coming up, okay? I mean, you guys get pumped about Schwarzenegger, but imagine being a teen or a young adult in the days when Schwarzenegger was actually becoming what he became. That was like, whoa. I mean, in those days, there was Schwarzenegger, there was Marilyn Monroe, there was Elvis. There'll never be people like this again. Because, like, in the movie scene, they had stars, but they weren't like they are. And and Marilyn Monroe brought it from here's our stardom to wow. I mean, she was, and she wasn't even that pretty. But she was the one that filled the slot of basically a goddess, you might say. And people wanted that and they went with that. And it cost her life. Same with Elvis. There will never be another star as big as Elvis. Because there wasn't any star like that. You know, just like some of these basketball stars and stuff. They, for them to come out and start playing the way they did, there will never be someone that could do those kind of scores again. There's a, that Pistol Pete guy. He still got some records standing from the college days, and he died on the court. But he played in a day where they played 50s white basketball, and he was playing like a black guy and knew how to play. I mean, they couldn't compete with him. He was, in, he was like an alien. You know, just nobody plays that good. They couldn't stop him. And so nobody will ever play against that 50s team again because everybody plays smarter than that now. So nobody will ever get to do as good as he did. Number wise, in Schwarzenegger was the same thing. He was the first real, actual muscle man, you know, Mr. Universe kind of guy. He he was the first, and there was so little to compare against him. There'll never be that again, you know. I mean, you look at Schwarzenegger in his early days. At his best, he didn't look as good as your average bodybuilder today, because they have things fine tuned a lot better. They took what he did and brought it to the next level multiple times. We have to learn from the people before us. That's why we have their testimonies. That's why they exist. Yet, you were there for that message. You were there. How many people do you know that are read off on that list? I know a couple. That's who I wanted to be. But that's because you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, be inspired. I mean, you want to you want to go all out for God? Then start reading these testimonies. You know, I listened to both of those books. The What Happened to My Spirit or whatever. I like that one a lot more. And I listened to the other one. Uh, it's so monotone, I don't like it. But I do agree with the more monotone one. When it comes to like, when you're saying... Christ the healer? Yeah, so that's, that's more monotone okay. one. So he was saying like, yeah, this is started reading, reading yeah. so that, that really <laughs> monotone. Really? Yeah, and well, like, well, I'm at the up. point I can yeah. I can overlook monotone issues. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, one of my earlier audiobooks, you know, was uh, um, oh, I can't think of the name now, but uh, Count of Monte Cristo. And when I first listened to it, it was free, so I'm listening to different readers from all over the world. You know, sometimes they're reading like, oh, that's a cool accent for that. Other times, like, just American, okay, whatever. Other times, they're reading somebody from India, I'm like, 
honestly, I can't make out what they're saying, you know? Um, so I can, I can tolerate a lot, but yeah, that's, it is kind of tough, but it's good stuff. I, I agree more on how he was saying, like, you shouldn't say in the name of Jesus or, or that will be done. I agree with that. Yeah. But I wasn't hundred percent. Like, cause like the other guy had a good point too, to a degree. So I'm going to tell you, I actually told him someone this morning, came for prayer, I said, you know, that guy, he was writing about the gifts of healing. The gifts of healing are different than mm -hmm. what Bosworth is talking about. Bosworth, and not many people do a whole lot of writing about what Bosworth is writing about. He's writing about every Christian should be walking in hell because we're all promised hell. And and it's, you know, you go to prayer, you get anointed for it, whatever, but it's, you don't even have to do all that. And that's why you got some testimonies of people in there like, you know, boy, according to what he's saying, I can get healed just like I got saved when I was in the Methodist church. I don't even have to go up there. And she didn't go up and she come back to her day crying like, what's wrong? And everybody's like, wow, she didn't even get prayed for. Why did she wait? Because you had to get numbers and wait. You didn't get, not everybody got prayed for. Like she had a number, she was to wait for prayer. What's up with her? I'm healed. Don't eat it. I'm good. Because there is that thing. That's not taught a whole lot, even in people, places where they believe this stuff. But if it's there, if it's real, so that's the main difference between the two books. And that's why the second one says you must always pray if it be God's will. Because they're operating in the gift of healing. Because it might not be God's will. In that book, he says, well, you know, I feel like God wants to heal knees right now. Because it's the gift of healing. It's what God is pouring out at that point on that people. That's it. Uh, and it might not happen tomorrow. But that's a lot different than God showed me in his word. that he promised that I'll be healed of this. So I have God's promise. Everyone else is out of the picture. It doesn't even matter. We get our own promise from God. And we stand on that promise. So we build our faith in God's promise. And that's what Bosworth talks about. Very, very different deal. But it's important to see both sides. Because they are both real. But there is a difference. You know? There's a big difference. Well, there's something I wanted to say quick before we go off on other things that are important. Yes, to talk about. But before we lose what we were talking about before, um, the thing about the testimonies, I'm not going to say they're not worth looking at, but I am going to say that it should start with you reading the Bible and listening to God first. And then if you need to if check out those testimonies, sure, but maybe God won't work that way, you know? Like maybe God won't make you a Billy Graham or a... Do you know why... Whatever that is, you know? That's I stress the testimonies. Sure. Because... It says in Revelation that they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Okay. We can read and study the Bible our whole life and still miss what God's doing. That's a fact. Okay. A very solid fact. When we read through other people's testimonies and hear people's testimonies, we get to see other perspectives, and it helps us notice things that otherwise we might miss. Okay, that, that's important. Because, unfortunately, we are human and like I always say, we're kind of dumb. We're called sheep. There's a reason for that. What's, what's the verse with the blood of the lamb and the will of testimony? Do you know? Because I Revelation, like I'm guessing 316, but I'm not sure. But you could Google Revelation blood of the lamb and it'll 